Hello. There's an old proverb which says to live your life is not so easy as to cross a field. In parallel, to learn to paint watercolour landscape is not so easy as just learning technique. What I mean by that is that we all, when we start off, long to have a technique to support the glorious things we see in the countryside when we want to put them down on paper. And the whole aspect of what we're on today is both watercolour technique and the love of landscape painting. As far as I'm concerned, you can't separate the two, and I wouldn't want to. I've always been in love with the landscape, and I've always been in love with watercolour painting, so the two together create a, uh, a happy mixture of enjoyment for me and a challenge at the same time and there's no reason at all why it shouldn't be the same for you. You can probably see that if I love the outside there's plenty of atmospheric shots to enjoy during this video um, and this gives the impression that I spend a lot of time actually painting outside. Now I'm actually a studio painter and that doesn't mean to say that I'm not in the countryside. I spend a lot of time out there observing and painting is all about observation. So what I want to put over is that whether you subscribe to the English tradition, that is sitting in front of a scene and painting it, or whether you subscribe to the, as I do, the oriental idea, that is if you see a scene, go home and paint it, um, it doesn't really matter. If it works for you, then it's great. As far as I'm concerned, the, the latter one works for me. I prefer to go home with the essence of it in my mind and put that down on watercolour paper. So it, do, it does mean actually training your visual memory and that is something that can only come with practice. There is no substitute for practice. Anyway, um, do enjoy this video, do enjoy the concept of the, the watercolour wash and do believe that though it seems difficult practice will make it come. So do enjoy and do appreciate that practice is all important, that you can find enjoyment and not, not gritting your teeth and saying I can't do it. You can find the enjoyment if you persevere and above all you're in love with that landscape which is what it's all about. Our first demonstration is going to involve a total wet and wet painting. When I say total wet and wet, it, as far as it is able to be total, there are just certain small elements at the end which will have to involve a small amount, say, of gouache or a small amount of wash. But as far as we're concerned, most of the painting, 90% of the painting, hopefully, will be done on a wet surface. So obviously the first thing we're going to do is to spray the surface. I use a, a spray bottle to do this because it's best to touch the surface of the paper as little as possible with the brush. It's a, quite a delicate surface even though it's 100% rag paper. And then just spread that out with a brush rather than actually ladling it on with a brush. And it's a matter of getting that surface totally wet it's a matter of making sure that every inch of the paper right up to the edges is actually damp. In fact more than damp, pretty wet because I want it to soak in and that is going to provide us with the basis for the painting for the next quite a few minutes and this is an all important stage even though it looks simple you certainly can't bypass it and certainly wouldn't want to. So having got the paper wet and it's a matter of holding it against the light, looking against the light to make sure that every inch of it is covered, it's then a question of letting it soak in and that also takes a few minutes to get it to the right situation where painting can start. So while I'm waiting for that I'll be explaining a bit about the materials I use, the equipment I use, 
in order to achieve some of these effects. I think that's wet enough now, so we'll explain a little bit about the paint and the brushes and the paper. The materials I use are as follows. The watercolour paper is Lana, spelt L-A-N-A. -A. It's a French 100% rag paper and it's 300 pounds in weight. The surface is rough, though actually the rough in Lana is very equivalent to the knot in Arsh. The only difference is that the surface might be the same, but the quality of the paper as well might be the same, but the whole concept of the paper is its softness and the great thing about Lana is that it's very absorbent and is ideal for wet in wet. The paints I use are artist quality and I buy them in 14 milliliter tubes. So I have French ultramarine, light red, raw sienna, alizarin crimson, Windsor Blue and Windsor Yellow. Also I have Payne's Grey. For my purposes I prefer the Roney Payne's Grey to the Windsor and Newton because the darks which I mix up with light red are better for banks and not so green as the Windsor and Newton. I also use gouache just for foregrounds in a very limited way and these are as follows. Permanent White, Olive Green, Scarlet Lake, Spectrum Yellow and Sky Blue. These are purely optional and purely according to your taste. I also use an oil painter's paper palette which I find useful because you can tear it off and throw it away after you've finished a painting instead of having to clear off all those hard little bits of paint and this is often quite tedious. The brushes I use are as follows. <clears throat> That's a hake brush though an English equivalent of the Chinese brush, which it is. <clears throat> also other Chinese brushes, that's a proper, proper Chinese brush, not expensive even though it's a big brush, eight or nine pounds at the most. A medium sized Chinese brush and two riggers, a large one and a size naught. I also use a shaving brush and a toothbrush. Toothbrush is for splattering and I have many other brushes as well. We might as well also briefly touch on the subject of composition. My understanding of composition is basically keeping the eye within the picture. We have to do this in an interesting way so that the eye does not either leave the picture or get bored in looking at the picture we normally would have some sort of focal point which we would understand not to be right in the centre of the picture or halfway down the picture that we've obviously read about many times. I obviously for focus on foreground foliage a lot as you've seen and I find this an interesting point because it helps the eye to actually pause for a second before going into the rest of the picture just gives added interest that is purely optional according to how you're feeling at the time some pictures might not require foreground foliage I think the paint the paper is in a situation where it's more or less able to be started it's, it's always a matter of judging it according to the light shining on it so I'm going to first of all mix some raw sienna because you will see from the few small guidelines I've done this is going to be a river scene and it's going to be into the sun which is my favorite mode of painting so we're going to have to leave the sun as white light obviously white light um, and paint round it so this will seem strange at first but I will start off with a circular movement of the brush in raw sienna. When people see this they usually take a sh make a sharp intake of breath because they wonder what earth I'm doing. <laughs> 
but all will be revealed as we proceed. So we're building up this raw sienna circle around the sun. Basically the sun itself is white light, but the yellow warm effect the sun's rays will radiate out from, radiate out from that central source of power. From that we'll mix a little alizar and crimson be still further warmth. This is purely background, you must realize this. And while it may seem strange at this stage, hopefully it will begin to take shape as we go along. So as you can see I'm using a, a large brush, a large Chinese brush with a circular movement and moving outwards from that light source. And obviously as we get further from it, we will get bluer and cooler. So I'm mixing some ultramarine into the alizarin crimson now. Who said skies shouldn't be colourful? And in a sense they dictate what the picture is all about. And I like to see some of the colour in the sky that is actually in the rest of the landscape. As I said earlier, this is all about a personal response to painting and this is my response to it. I'm always so devastated when I look into the sun and see that amazing source of light for which we couldn't exist, without which we couldn't exist, and to actually see the way it characterizes all that's around it. And I think you'll agree with me that there is nothing more impressive than those late afternoon scenes when the sun's lower in the sky and is actually permeating the whole of the scene with its golden light. So there we have the basis of a sky. I'm actually going to mix some French Ultra with some light red. And radiate out from that point. Perhaps some streaky bits of cloud, which you tend to get in the sunsetty skies. The whole idea is to lead the eye in which has got to be inevitably anyway, to that source of light. It needs to be a little warmer, so we mix a bit more light red with that French ultramarine. The uh, colour that goes on at first usually dries a lot lighter in watercolour. Consequently, it's important to have a certain amount of strength in the picture, or else it will get named as wishy-washy, as watercolours seem to traditionally be called so often. I think all that's changing now, hopefully, but in the past that did have that stigma. And it is import important to avoid that and to ensure that the colour goes on in a, a bold way so that when it finally dries out it's not too light. Now we've got to try and soften perhaps the starkness of this, this yellow light. We can perhaps drag some of these clouds straight into it so as not to make it too obvious. As you can see I'm using my brush in pretty continual motion because I'm adapting and merging these colours all the time because you're dealing with a sky here, you're not dealing with something that's solid. You're dealing with something that needs to be toned down in one sense because it's an amorphous, vaporous substance and we can't treat it as though we're painting a building. I've just got some clear water just to lift off a bit of that where it's gone a bit too far. <coughs> 
but I still feel that perhaps we should just take on or take off a little bit of the intensity of this this yellow and as I'm doing this I'm really sort of feeling my way through the painting and usually find that in the end the effect that I'm looking for is available. Remember that we've got to do an awful lot while this paper is wet so it's quite a tall order and we're in a sense racing against the clock to ensure that we get the rest in. Well that has certainly given us our light source. Now I'm going to mix some Winsy Yellow with some raw sienna and some French Ultra and start in the, the banks. So we're going to bring in this mixture which has created a fairly warm green and as you'll see I don't actually use a tube green but mix the greens always because then you can adjust them according to the painting you're doing. The tube greens tend to be rather intense and the mixed greens somehow seem to have more naturalness in them. Now remember what I said earlier about the the fact that when it dries it dries lighter and this green may appear at this stage to be rather stark but hopefully in the end once we've added more colour and it's began to dry there will be certainly a more naturalness about it. I'm actually adding a bit of light red into it as well. You'll notice as well that I very rarely dip my brush into the water. It's a big brush for a start so it holds a lot of water and it enables you to keep going for quite a long time. I'm mixing light red and French Ultra for the dark edge of the bank. I'm actually going to drop a bit of Alizarin Crimson into this foliage because I do like to see colour in the grass just as much as I like to see colour in the sky and there's all sorts of colours but if you're going to put some sort of red in you know you've got to balance it up to a certain extent with a bit of blue it is so easy to put stark colours in without being aware of colour balance at this stage I'm suddenly noticing this is a bit too blue along the bottom of this bank so we can always add a bit of light red to remedy that now while we're there we will perhaps do the reflections in the water bear in mind we've got the light source there so we're going to try and if possible keep that by itself and we're going to repeat to a certain extent what we see in the sky so we've got the yellow sun rays there reflected there and we're going to leave the light bit for the actual power source of the sun and we're going to use vertical brush strokes into the water. Remember with water that it's a reflective surface consequently you're going to get verticals for the reflections also it is a surface and you're going to get horizontals as well you'll see that my paper has actually dried off here but that can't be helped and as I say so often in these type of demonstrations the great thing is not to worry about it when we, con when we concern ourselves about our paintings get concerned about what we're doing
get concerned about whether we're getting the right effect, it probably shows in the painting and brings out that tension when we really want the freedom. Painting is all about freedom. Atmosphere is put on with a big brush and when we paint it there is no reason not to use the same principle. So you can see that we have got the makings of a landscape here and this is all done while the surface is wet. It's all about light, it's all about mood, it's all about atmosphere, it's all about feeling. And really if you're not feeling something for the landscape then there's no way that you will paint a convincing landscape. You've got to have seen that landscape first. You've got to have gone around that corner and then seen that amazing scene and made perhaps a sharp intake of breath. That at least would prove to you, or prove to yourself, that you have the feeling for the landscape that is so necessary to be able to be turned into paint onto paper. As I said earlier, the techniques are all important, but they're not the only thing. If you've got that feeling for the landscape, that love for it, then that will show in your painting. And it won't be just purely an exercise in technique. I'm feeling that perhaps we need to intensify these banks still further. We have got the light red and the ultramarine still. Uh, later on, if it dries, I might use some Payne's Grey mixed with light red. Now, Payne's Grey is not a very nice colour. It's a blue, bluey, dark grey sort of colour. And the only use I find is that it fans out beautifully in a wet and wet wash, particularly if that wet and wet wash is drying very fast. And then it has its uses. Conversely, it is very difficult if the wash is very wet because it goes hopelessly out of control. Got to add a little bit more light red here. And while we're here, I'm going to just use my tissue to preserve this light from the sun. Which unfortunately, we've got a bit of paint on there. As I use my own adage and not worry about it, because there's a way out in most things, even in watercolour, and even in this most difficult and dangerous way of painting. After all, painting a whole scene wet in wet is one of the most dangerous ways of painting the landscape, but also one of the most rewarding. Now we mustn't forget these other banks here. Remember the river is winding its way up there. And we've perhaps got to get a little bit bluer and more distant as we handle those banks in the distant. Mix a little bit of ultramarine. and just formulate the shape of the banks against the ones in front. Now, while we're there, we need to think about some background trees. I will use the blue and the red again. And we will use various degrees of wash strength in this and we'll mix the blue on the paper and then perhaps add a bit of red and just get the right amount of what we want as we go along. A very good tip is actually to mix your paint actually on the paper rather than on the palette because then you get pure virgin paint instead of mixing it around on the palette and losing the strength of it on the palette when really it's meant to be on the paper. So, perhaps we'll blue some of this distant part off a bit more, adding a bit of French Ultra into that. While we're getting that, we're getting a little bit of splatter from the brush, which has gone into the sky, which we have to be careful with. And you might just use a, a damp, small brush just to get those out. So touch in like that, it usually gets it out. Now the tree is the other side to balance it. I'm afraid you won't see very well what I'm doing because my hand is over the picture. 
when we get nearer to the or beneath where the sun is perhaps warm up the trees a bit because the warmth of the sun is going to characterize what's beneath it and we can start to have a warmer effect for those distant trees conversely we're perhaps going to blue off some of the trees that are farther from the sun as I said it's not too late to add to an existing wash and if we feel it should be a bit cooler or if we want it to be a bit warmer we can still add that extra color to the wash just to adjust it to according to how we want it now we've got a little bit of French ultra court on the paper there I've got to squeeze the brush out perhaps ferry that around a bit just to disperse the paint and just add a little bit of light red over the top there's always ways and means in watercolour and don't ever think that you're past hope that the painting has totally lost itself there are times when this can be so but often if we are adept at judging the situation as we go along we can usually remedy the situation well I'll put the big Chinese brush aside and now use a smaller Chinese brush and I'm going to just play around with some more clumps of trees in front of these ones remember we're still working in this wet in wet wash the painting is still wet we can still create something within these trees here now we're assuming we know in fact that the light source is is there so we can actually know that the light is going to be hitting the front of these clumps of trees so we can formulate something in front of it or behind it should I say um, to make it look so the light is hitting the front of the trees so as you can see already by placing something a clump of trees behind the one you've just done but not touching it you're leaving a bluey section which could well be the light hitting the front of that those trees as you see I'm mixing the two the French ultra and the light red all the time I'm adding a little bit of one a little bit of the other adjusting it as I go along we'll just do some more trees here and you can see that's giving a bit of form to those trees that I originally did earlier on this is quite a small brush to use in these circumstances but it gives a little bit more control and I find it quite useful because as you'll see later on this, these brushes can actually be bent so many different ways so that they they can in a sense be all things to all men they can create any sort of effect you want I don't know whether that's where the Chi why the Chinese use them but they certainly knew a thing or two about landscape painting as you can see here this has begun to create a watermark because it's beginning to dry off if we get too carried away we're not going to have enough time to work something into these this grass here but we'll make what we can from this drying off because an odd hard edge or two in a, in a atmospheric landscape doesn't go amiss because it shows a contrast and that contrast is often appropriate after all what is painting all about but to do with counter change to do with light against dark hard against soft and all those sort of things you're throwing one thing off the against the other warm against cool continually you're throwing off these contrary elements and creating a sort of tension in the painting 
Now, I got some sort of blob of water into here, but all is not lost. We can actually form with a dry, with a wet brush, or damp brush, should I say, certain lines which actually lift off the paint and create certain textures. As you can see, it's lifting off the line work of the brush and this can be regarded as the clumps of grass just hitting the light. And it can be quite useful just to give a small amount of definition to distant clumps of grass and banks. Back to the big brush again and we will just try and put a little bit more colour in while we're there and do something about this wet blob. I've got to live by what I said just now that if something happens don't worry about it there's always a way out. So somehow a bit of water dropped onto there created that ugly watermark which is the fear of the watercolorist. But often these scenes can be created or used to create texture and the great thing is not to panic. It's drying off fast around here and if necessary we can de deepen some of this with some light red and Payne's grey. We can put a little bit more depth into these banks. But bear in mind it's certainly almost at the watermark stage. And I think I've got virtually to the position of no return in this wash. And we will soon be in a situation where we will have to dry the painting off and just do the final touches to create the landscape. We've got to keep this warm, so plenty of light red there. We are going to do some foreground flowers, hopefully. So we're formulating a mossy sort of bank. And while I'm here, because there's still plenty of wetness in those distant trees, I'm just going to do a little bit more depth in those clumps of bushes or whatever you'd like to call them so that we have that almost amorphous look to the trees which echoes the rest of the picture yet we know what it is we know that it's foliage we know that it's distant trees and bushes but in a sense it's providing that echo to the rest of the picture and just keeping the same attitude going of mood and the softness of the late afternoon light. You have to be looking around the picture all the time in fact just to make sure there's any part that can still be worked on while it's wet. As you can see most of the rest of the picture is actually virtually dry and this has a lot to do with the heat of the room or the the general temperature anyway, general humidity possibly and sometimes these will stay wet for an incredible amount of time. All helped of course as I said earlier by the type of paper I use which can stand wet washes and absorbs the water so as to be able to stay wet a nice long time. I still feel we need a little bit of bit more depth in these banks so we can perhaps put a bit here and there just to give a an element of sharpness as I did say that you have to throw one off against another and you can't have a painting totally soft because it will look just out of focus there's got to be an element of focus in it, even in a landscape like this.
so there's still a little bit of time to work and we can darken this off as well and it just leaves really the rest of the painting for the sharper bits while I'm here I will actually put a wet while it's wet put a tree in to the wet surface and hope that we can manage this because this is crucial for instance it putting a narrow line of paint like this uh, can certainly go very amorphous and if you want a tree to stand out you want an element of definition in it but to me the whole character of the landscape is being dictated and I prefer to do as much as possible while it is wet perhaps I'll use a damp brush just to take the side off this tree so it looks as though the light is actually touching the side of the trunk we just have to play around until we get the effect we want we certainly perhaps need more Payne's grey and light red and use almost solid pigment a bit more light red because it needs to be warmer and we will make it look as though it's actually growing out of something rather than floating we go back to our other medium sized brush and get some form of green to put over the top there warm that up a little bit, darken that a little bit as you can see it is actually a bit too dark at the moment but it's something's got to show up against the background trees we've still got an opportunity to lift out a little bit of paint with a damp brush at the moment I think it's still too wet to be lifted out to any extent So we'll extend that a little bit. It is virtually dry there now. Use the side of the brush. Let's green it off a little bit more. A bit more Windsor yellow. And while we're there, hopefully it's still wet. We'll use a bit of blue and red to bring the reflection down which will obviously have a wobble at the bottom of it and that's as far as I can go at this stage just before we finish this section of the painting I just will lift out the distant tree trunks which tend to show against woods and clumps of trees with a damp brush again as you can see it's got to be pretty nearly dry but not quite and with a fine brush, a rigger and some dampness, just clear water on it you can actually do some vertical marks and perhaps give some point of interest in those clumps of trees as you can see I'm just touching the paper with a damp brush and if you know anything about woods and you see them there's always the bare trunks to the edge of the wood which tend to always show up and I always like to see these in a picture they are an integral part of the landscape and I find it impressive because it gives a sort of a vertical against what seems to be a plenty of horizontals and it echoes the tree that's already been put in. <laughs> 
we will now actually have to dry off the picture and we will start the final stage. We're now in a situation where we can place some foreground foliage on this bank. This is in a sense an optional extra to the painting but I often like to put this in because it does actually give a point of interest in the foreground which you can pause on and then perhaps move on into the rest of the picture. Certainly it's all a matter of taste. I, I do like to see grasses and various things in foregrounds of pictures if I'm photographing in the countryside. I always like to put grasses in the foreground so it must accord a bit with my personality in the sense that I do appreciate the minute details of nature as well as the large big brush details of na uh, effects of nature. It does seem to me that the important thing is to use the same the same speed of movement and in fact I, I do need to use speed at this stage because of video time in dealing with foreground detail because the the whole picture is done on a on a very loose and atmospheric mode and if we start getting bogged down in very minute detail, even in foregrounds, we're going to make such a difference between the foreground and the rest of it that um, it would look like two separate paintings. So we've got to handle this loosely. And once again, we're only indicating. We're doing a few the tops of some cow parsley in the strategic locations. Some of them bunched together, others astray. And remember that the more distant ones are slightly smaller and they get bigger as you get towards the foreground. So we can place a few of these in. And I'm using gouache here, which is used virtually neat from the tube because gouache when, when watered down will not actually have any effect on the painting at all. It will dry without any impact. So you have to use virtually neat paint to do this, especially with white like this. We'll now go to a smaller brush. I was using actually a, a larger rigger for that. Now I'll go to the small rigger and we'll mix a little bit of green and white for the stalks of the cow parsley. I often find they move into the central stem. But once again we're only indicating we're not trying to do a, a botanical treatise on small plants of woodlands. So we've got a few stalks in. Now going back to the medium sized Chinese brush, we will dry this off by squeezing it out very thoroughly so that it virtually splits up and mix some gouache on it. A bit of green, white and yellow. And with a dobbing effect just dob the brush on the paper where it splits up into lots of different strands and creates the effect of foliage. As you can see the brush has split up into about seven or eight different points because it's dry and it tends to be only Chinese brushes that do this. That's why I find them so effective in so many circumstances. And you can use this principle just to give the effect of foliage detail, as long as you don't go too wild. Squeeze out again and perhaps get another colour. We'll mix a bit of red and yellow 
get an orangey effect and dob a few more points in. Perhaps a little bit more white and then we'll go back to normal watercolour again. So as to indicate the dark fronds of grasses, etc., against the lightness of the water. Remember what we said, light against dark, dark against light. And this bank is purposely fairly dark in order to show up the lightness of the foliage that's on it. And we're going to have to use normal watercolour again to work between the points of gouache just to darken up the shadow area underneath the foliage here again if it's too stark we can actually just use a damp clean brush to disperse some of this paint doesn't matter if it goes over some of the gouache but really it does need to be darker this can be done by painting actually underneath the cow parsley certain circumstances and in so, so doing enhancing their whiteness so there's lots of different ways of approach this is just my particular approach and the approach that I find enjoyable a little bit more dark so you can see we're just working around the cow parsley and hopefully creating a foreground that looks as though it's got some movement in it yet it's not a mass of detail but gives perhaps more the effect of detail now we will use a small brush again and just put a few strands of grass against the lightness of the water do a few small dots on the grass to indicate pods or seed heads or whatever and it's just that fineness of brushwork just highlights the broadness of the rest of it which is once again another contrary it's detail against breadth and in view of video time I feel that we should leave the picture there because it's said more at most that I want to say just before we go I will actually create a bit more movement so to speak round the further bank so as not to make this foreground so cluttered and yet the other lot so smooth so we can actually create a few points of foliage etc spreading out onto the further bank so as to lead the eye further along into the picture and yet not cluttering the picture up too much with endless detail just do a few points on this bank as well create a bit of balance and a bit of green and there's nothing more for me to do now but do the odd line where the water meets the bank
and then to get a mount and put it round the picture. As you will see in this second painting, I've got a few lines on it to indicate a scene with a barn and some distant buildings. And it's located once again on a, on a river. And that really is in order to demonstrate the effect of light. There's going to be a different light in this picture to the previous one. It's going to be a little harder and it has its own appeal. It demonstrates the translucency of the water and if we've managed that we've succeeded to a certain extent. So I'm actually going to plough straight in. I have, I've wetted the paper and I'm going to put some raw sienna along the base of the sky with a hake brush. Not a Chinese one, one by Pro Art, you'll notice. And then a small amount of Alizarin crimson. Remember what I said about the colours toning down as you carry on. But I want, in a sense, a warm sky, even though it is going to be a blue sky. But it's going to be winds of blue at the top, which is a equivalent to the old Prussian blue, more or less. Um, Prussian blue did have the habit of fading, so apparently the winds of blue is a more effective equivalent. This is, in a sense, going to be the base of the blue sky because on this small rectangle you're not seeing the whole dome of the sky and as you probably know the sky tends to get more and more towards ultramarine the more you get towards the dome the highest point of it so we will do the more greeny blue which relates to the lower part of the sky which equates with this Windsor blue and you will see that I will actually use French ultramarine in the reflections in the water. And I'm just going to tip the painting up to let the colour run down. Just to merge the, the wash in. Squeeze out the brush and we will take pure French ultramarine and take a band of this along the base. Looks a bit harsh, I know. In fact, we're picking up something from the edge of the paper here. All is not lost, as I said earlier. Take some clear water. We can usually get rid of that. So a little bit more ultramarine. And actually leave the top part of the river here, the plain white of the paper. You want to get that pure translucency which you will see later on and will become evident once the darkness of the banks have been put in and the shadow underneath them. So I just want to heighten that French ultramarine in the base the water a little bit more because in a sense that water is reflecting the dome of the sky while all you're seeing actually in the picture of the sky is the more base part of it so the the difference in the water is in a French ultramarine cast to it which as I said relates more to the higher part of the sky but does have the effect of reflecting the beauty of that great void that is over the top of it. This is not going to be an all wet and wet picture like the other one. 
is going to be a succession of washes in this, but I'm trying to do as much as I can in the first wash. So I'm mixing a bit of Windsor Yellow, Raw Sienna and French Ultramarine again and just using it on the, the banks around this river. Now in doing so, some of it is expanding into the water. I want to take that away. In certain circumstances it might have been okay, but in these circumstances I want to preserve the purity of the water and the extreme translucency of it. In doing so I need to get rid of those green expanded washes. So we will put a little bit more green into that. Squeeze the brush out a bit more because perhaps the brush is a little bit on the wet side and that's what's making the washes expand. Dry them off a bit by using a squeezed out brush. Turn over to the medium Chinese brush and put in with a little bit of French Ultra, mixed perhaps with a bit of Windsor Blue, the background trees with a distance. So you see we're going to miss out this tree here. It will actually stay more or less where it's put, even though it's in a wet wash. It's surprising how it will stay approximately where it's put. And a lot of people don't always appreciate this. They tend to feel it's going to run away with them and that they're going to get hopelessly out of control. A lot of that is because of the extreme wetness of the brush or the paper. You have got to hit it at the right time and that comes with practice. You've got to wait for it to dr dry to a certain extent, yet not dry too much. So it's that judging of the time that is where the practice is involved. You can only do this through practice. We'll make a few more marks with some light red and French Ultra along on the grass. And we'll perhaps show a little bit of the edge of the banks, but this is going to be shown up properly in a later time. And I think at this stage this is all I can do at, in this wash and I will actually dry this off and will be with you very shortly. We've now dried off that first wash and at the moment I will actually start attacking the barn and hopefully the rustic quality of it will come through in due course. So cover it all over with one wash of light red raw sienna and French ultra. Just cover the whole thing. Keep the apex of the roof nice and rocky because these barns have usually been up many years. And what you're doing actually is creating a small wet and wet wash in which you can work. Now, I always like to see, I'm just going to move to the other brush by the way, I always like to see green in an old barn because the moss of the ground and all its surroundings have usually got into it and merged it in. While I'm here I will take off the base of the barn, merge it into a sense, in a sense into the grass. We can actually etch out the shape of it a bit later on. But what we'll try and do now is get some green into it with some French Ultra and some Windsor Yellow and a bit of raw sienna. Just drop it in, let it, a bit like a watermark, let it 
find its own level within the area of the barn. If you want to, you can rock the board around a bit to let it move. But at this stage, it's difficult to see what sort of order it has in it. But remember, a bit like the atmospheric landscape, you have to start off with big washes and work within those. So we've got the basic colour of the barn, plus the green mossy character of it, which relates to its surroundings. And we have to wait for that to dry a little bit. While we're doing that, we will work on these other buildings. Remember with buildings that the simpler you can handle them, the better. Perhaps we won't let it run into the barn but we'll just go over the whole thing with a wash of the similar characteristics of what I've been painting the barn with. We'll assume the light is coming from the, the right, so we'll leave the end of that building there untouched in the, on the basis that it's catching the light, and we'll go over the roof and leave out the gable Remember, don't be daunted by buildings. You can always remember that. That the simpler you work into them, the better it will be. People get confused by brickwork and all that sort of thing. But if you can remember that, like everything else, that virgin wash is always the best for portraying anything and the building is no exception to this rule. So we will just work the wash down into the building and like the barn we can drop in some other colours if we want. If we want to blue it off a bit we can drop in some blue. Leave a few gaps for windows. There's another building here sideways on so we're going to leave the side of the building because it's catching some of the light. And there you've got the bases of a few small buildings in the distance. I will just drop in a bit of blue into it, certain parts, just to vary the wash. Because though washes are beautiful, they're even, even more beautiful when they're mixed up with other colours and the colours are feathering their way into them. And that is the beauty of the wet and wet wash. It handles what you put into it and disperses it in its own way and gives its own character to it, which is virtually beyond your control. So while you've got 90% control, that odd 10% is what creates the interest and the unique character of any particular painting. How often you must have heard about happy accidents and certainly that applies in watercolour more than anything. I'm now going to dry this off again and we'll just work more into these buildings a little bit more. Having dried off the barns, we're going back to a fine rigger brush to put in an element of detail into the big foreground one. So you can use the brush quite dry. Nature doesn't put lines around everything, but in a certain element with these sort of barns, there is with their boarding, a certain element of, of line work involved. The thing is not to be too precise in the way you handle these 
beautiful buildings. So already you can see there's the beginnings of a structure emerging. Go thick and thin. Go dark in some parts, thin in others, just to accentuate the wobbly character of its structure, which has got that way over the years. Remember to indicate, perhaps from the base as well, a few planks. You can also formulate in the roof a hole. You could say it's a derelict barn. We can leave the structure of the lars underneath that hold on the tiles. just formulate those by negative painting. In other words, just by leaving, leaving out. So you're just leaving out the the rafters or whatever you call them that support the tiles. And you can formulate any size hole you want. Just do a little bit more work. Careful to maintain the angle of the roof. And now, with a bigger brush again, the medium sized one, with a, a ready greeny wash. Just indicate a few up lines with the brush wet but not too wet and it further enhances the rustic and almost derelict character of the building. So there you have an old barn. And quite simply, as I said, buildings are very simple. You have there something is very rustic and old, yet handled in quite a simple way, which is all you need to do in these circumstances. Just the odd bits of brushwork here and there, just to indicate. Let a bit of the dark washes merge into the still wet washer just put on. A bit of Payne's grain, light red. Let them spread, and that all enhances the, the rustic quality of the structure. Now, let us carry on to the distant buildings. Perhaps go to a medium sized rigger, or quite a large rigger really, and go over the base of the buildings. You can leave a hole for the windows if you want on that one. You can see well enough. We'll still go over that, leaving out that hole for the window there. But obviously the roof will be taking more light, being more horizontal to the sky than the walls are, and they therefore will be lighter than the vertical parts of these structures. If you feel you've gone over it too heavy, you can always go over with a, a tissue and just take some of the intensity off. Go to a fine rigger with light red and Payne's grey and just etch out underneath the, the eaves, not too heavily, 
but just to give a certain form to the buildings. And there you can see how very simply you can create some structures in the countryside. Go into the windows, go one side of them, to leave the light bits on one side as, it's as if the light is hitting the edge of the window frame. And with a few strategically placed lines, just etch out the, the salient features of the buildings. Let's indicate the bait at the top of that roof. So therefore you've now got some structures in the countryside. We might come back after a while when that's dry and using a dry brush just put a bit more texture into it. We'll see about that. Now, using heavy, a heavy drying wash of light red and Payne's grey with a bit of Windsor, Windsor yellow, create a bit of texture in these banks. Just use the brush on its side. Don't worry if it seems too sudden at first. You can always go over with a wettish wash with nothing on the brush just take the intensity off. But the mixture of a wet wash and a drying one often creates some interesting pointers and some inter interesting textures in the grass of the countryside. We still haven't completely given the clue to these banks we're dealing with these very differently from the previous painting but this should show up in time because once we've put the reflection underneath the bank it will show up the whole structure far more as you can see this is a very much different day very much more wintry there's not going to be greenery on the trees there's going to be naked trees, their branches showing, and the light is much harder. The reflections are going to be harder as well. So it's going to be a very type of different type of picture, but it's going to be perhaps a more clear and, and etched out picture than the other one. Once again, a whole different all game, whole different characteristic, and then that's what nature is all about. All its characteristics are there to be seen. Just put a few indicators around the base of the buildings, show that they're actually sitting in something. That line, that blue line, is a little bit hard. We'll just take the top off that with a damp brush. And I think I will be in a situation once again to have to dry off another wash. We're now in a position to continue with some of the distant trees. And my aim in this picture is to keep it as simple as possible. A for your purpose, purposes, it's, it won't help you if you're going to clutter it up with endless, an endlessly complicated picture. The other thing is video time, and the other thing is, anyway, the, the factor that the simpler a picture is, often the more effective it is. So we're going to do this, this tree here. There's plenty of ways of, tracking, of attacking bare trees. You can either turn the picture upside down and pull it towards you, or you can do it this way. I tend to do it always, but we'll go with the way the growth of the tree at this stage and work up from the bottom. And this is what I often tell people is the only time to have a nervous twitch when you're painting is when you flick in the, the branches. You need a very quick movement to 
get in those tapered branches because the, the brush when you think of it has to leave the, the paper in an arc so that it, fi it tapers, the branch tapers towards its end rather than stays the same thickness all the way. So remember that the tree is not just sideways, it doesn't just come out at the sides, it comes towards you and that the branches come towards you as well and that they come out at all angles. It's so easy to paint a, a tree and just see it as, as a pointing from west to east rather than north to south and just imagining the branches just come out one side each side of it but we have to remember they're coming out at all angles of the compass so we have to bring the branches out towards us as well then we can start to formulate the shape of the tree with a small brush we can start to show the actual shape by using some small vertical lines you can if you want to do those first and work into that but immediately it starts to take shape when you do that and remember that the tree grows into a multiplicity of tiny branches towards its outer edges and in a sense those little vertical lines are an indicator of that you can also do it by dragging the brush downwards. There's so many ways you can handle this. But at the moment, this, this sort of picture, so different from the other one, is a very sharp, clearly defined picture. I feel like defining the tree. Just remember I left that tree too high to bring it down farther. Also have to thicken up the, the trunk and have a, a recognized trunk going into the tree or a recognized bit coming from it because the whole thing that people don't appreciate is, is the tapering of branches and that every bit that comes out of a, out of a central trunk must be that much thinner because of the life it's taken in in coming out of that central one. It is in a sense sucked a bit of life out of that central stem if you like and that central stem will be all the thinner for it as it continues up its upward way. You just need very quick movements in handling these. Just a few more marks around there. I want to delineate a few at that point and that gives you a tree. We might perhaps just bring another one out here. Once again observation is necessary. Trees are not easy to do but the whole key is observation. So bring something out there as well. Now we'll have some sort of twiggy bits coming out from the behind this barn. We'll assume there's some sort of tree or shrubby growth behind it and we'll just formulate a few nervous flicks of the wrist. As you see there's a slight wobble when I bring my wrist out. In fact, I'm probably using my whole arm rather than my just my hand or my fingers. It's quite a useful thing to remember to let the whole arm make the movement, as I hope you can see. So we'll, we'll do a few small pieces at the top of the well just to dictate where they are where the environs or the 